Okay, I think we'll start. Good afternoon, everybody. Really excited to be here in Rome. Um, we're going to talk about monitoring big data systems today. And uh, I'll start off with a short presentation of myself. Okay, so my name is Demi Benari. Uh, I'm currently the co-founder of VP R&D of our startup, com startup company called Panorays. It's an Israeli-based company. Uh, also, I do communities. Um, I founded like two and a half years ago a community called Big Things. It's focused mainly in big data technologies, DevOps, data science, and another community, uh, GDG, you have it in Italy too, a Google Developer Group of Cloud, mostly focused in private clouds and uh, public cloud providers. In the past, uh, I was eight years at the Air Force. I was a uh, software engineer, a team leader uh, in a missile defense system, and afterwards I worked at a company called uh, Windward. It's a maritime analytics company, and many of the things and the tools that uh, I'll, I'll be talking uh, in the presentation is sort of something that we've implemented uh, a simple solution on how to monitor big data systems. It doesn't have to be that complicated. And basically, I'm interested in any technology. I'm a true geek. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the agenda of the talk. Uh, lots of not funny jokes. And why do I say that? Uh, because my wife is a software engineer too, and uh, during the time that I was making this talk, she said that I'm really not a funny person because of the slides. I don't care because I make myself laugh, so this is uh, really important. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the problem definition and the environment that we've had. Uh, and we'll talk about aspects of monitoring, okay? Uh, metrics, data stores, dashboards, al alerting, and we'll do a short summary of all of the things that we've talked about uh, to make this solution work. An aspect that I won't touch almost at all is uh, service discovery. One thing that we'll, when we start off with the, talking about microservices, etc., uh, we need service discovery in our system. And this is a whole different subject that I won't touch because it's a different lecture and we can talk like for hours only on, on that. Uh, just to start off, how many people here are devs? Hand raised. Okay, a lot. How many are in the DevOps side and the operation side? Great. Okay, so basically, both Nicole and JC did a good build up for this talk because they've set up some many basic problems of measuring things and uh, how to monitor and what are the problems of operation and developers tension between the two communities. So once we start off talking about big data systems, we start off talking about all of these tools, okay? MongoDB, Hadoop, Cassandra as a database, Apache Spark as a distributed com uh, computing framework, and starting off uh, working with cloud service pro providers like Amazon. How many of you use Amazon or Google Cloud? A lot, okay? Most of the people today, even small startups and big companies starting to use uh, extensively cloud service providers. And all of these technologies bring like the big data world to many, many kind of problems. Let's first define big data, okay? Because it's a buzzword and many people like to use it. I like to define it through the three V model, okay? Volume, talking about how much data do we have. Talking about velocity, how fast the data is coming. And variety, different ver kinds of data, JSONs, unstructured data, uh, proprietary protocols, many, many different kind of things th that come and we need to digest all of the data, store it, and do some interesting things with it because we don't, don't just store data. Once you have this kind of problem, when you say, yes, I have lots of these, and when I mean lots, how much is big data? I can say that like from our use case at Windward, when, when I used to work there, we had like around 100 gigabytes of raw data coming on every day, okay? And afterwards, we used to like duplicate the data, process it, and create more layers of data. This is an estimation by my side of medium data, okay? When you start talking about big data, it's more like companies like Google, uh, when you have like, I don't know, hundreds of terabytes, hundreds of petabytes flowing to the system every day. So when we need to monitor things, what are the aspects that we need to take in account? 
First of all, the most evident one is the infrastructure. Everybody knows that we have like heavily uh, infrastructure-based monitoring systems in which we uh, measure CPU, memory, etc. Afterwards, we comes the layer of the data that we need to monitor. Uh, how much data do we have? Where is the data? Is all of the data exist? Does all, does all the data exist? Again, another aspect that probably most of us don't even care about as developers or as operation people is monitoring the process of the product, okay? Measuring of usability of features, maybe. And this interests the business more than actually it interests us. And afterwards, of course, the business level, okay? Uh, one of the most amazing things that I saw when I went in some company in Israel is a big dashboard showing only one number. And hopefully that number is always rising. How much money does the company make? Okay, and when you see that number rising, it's kind of hypnotic and you can just look at the screen and even if it's a big number, it's really, really impressive. And this is like the KPI, the relevant measurement that when you explain the business, why you need more servers or why you need more manpower, this is the easiest way to show it to them, okay? Let's start off with the basic structure of any application that we start building. Uh, everybody likes to use the microservices buzzword. Basically, every application starts off this way, like a big monolith in which we like, start adding more and more features. And this is the structure of infrastructure. We uh, see the OS part, uh, the CPU, memory, and disk. Afterwards, we have the processes level, databases, Java servers, maybe some more like application servers, web servers, load balancers that might be uh, hardware load balancers or like software ones. And afterwards, we have some kind of user interaction applications, maybe like uh, some other systems that we interact with. And of course, we need to monitor all of these things. So basically, we had some kind of solution to report metrics to. What happens when we start off with really using microservices? And this is the basic scheme of our uh, software. We have some kind of database. Service A is working with it. It's sending data to it some kind of queue. Service B is working on top of a cache that sits on a layer of a database. It reports to the queue as well. It reports back to some kind of web server. And Service C is digesting data from the queue and does more things and saves and persists data in some kind of database. And I have some kind of analytics cluster that collects data from both of the databases and does some kind of reporting to some kind of other database. Okay. It sounds complicated enough, okay? And we're talking only about like four services in the system. What happens if like service A is in the responsibility of team A, service B has the responsibility of team B, and service C and uh, that web server is on a different uh, team as well. Who's monitoring everything, okay? And who do we show the monitoring? So let's talk more uh, in elaboration about some basic concepts. We've talked about monitoring, so let's show some kind of ways of monitoring. There's white box, box monitoring, showing the internals, uh, seeing the internal metrics of the operation system, and we have black box monitoring. I want to see if the whole process is working uh, great together. I want to show that monitoring in some kind of solution, so we have dashboards for that. And we need to do something actionable with all of the problems that emerge. So we have alerting. The root cause, and we've talked about cause in different uh, lectures today, uh, is what actually uh, done, I don't know, what happened in the system that made the problem that we see as users, I don't know, high latency or a system not working. And once we start off with working with distributed systems, we start talking in the notion of nodes and machines. Machines as physical ones, and nodes can be both logical and physical. When we talk about deployment, this basically is every change that we make in the system. Even if it's deploying a new container, changing configuration of our application server, or I don't know, like really ramping up the whole environment. And one of the most important things that we need to report back to our superiors or like uh, to our customers are KPIs. We talked about SLAs, key performance indicators. This is basically the definition by us of what we need to achieve. Uh, let's talk a bit about the data flow and the environment of our use case uh, that we've Im implemented at Windward. Uh, let's talk a bit about the structure of the data. 
it's a maritime analytics platform. So basically what I did with missiles uh, at the Air Force, I did with ships uh, at Windward. Uh, we were showing geolocations and extra metadata over that, these geolocations, and the data was coming over time. So it was basically time series data. Uh, different types of messages. We had some kind of protocol that we needed to digest. And all of the data was encoded just for compression reasons because we, we were getting a lot of data and we don't want to save it in some kind of like sparse format like XML or like JSON. And of course, we, need, we had the problem of uh, introducing late arriving data that was because of functions of transmission or many different uh, causes. This was the data flow because we're engineers and we like schemas. Uh, external data sources coming, we, we used to store them at, uh, on Amazon S3. We used to do entity resolution with Apache Spark and store them in different kinds of persistency layers. Afterwards, we used to create some more analytics layers over that data, and we used to uh, divide it to two different systems. One system was the anomaly detection one, that single percentage that does something wrong, illegal phishing maybe, uh, maybe some kind of weird actions uh, in the middle of the sea, um, human trafficking, many things like it. And we had a specific use case for that for intelligence uh, customers. And we had market trends in which we take all of the data in the world and we see, let's say, where is the, all of the oil in the world moving on. Technical environment description. We had Jenkins orchestration servers uh, in which we had our, all our CI CD uh, process on. Uh, we had an analytics cluster of Apache Spark and we started off with Hadoop and then switched on to Amazon's S3 as a storage layer. And the surprising thing maybe to say is that we had all of our environments on top of a single cluster. It was again a management decision. Okay, because most of the times people uh, like to divide their production system and their development and staging system to different physical clusters. But again, for us, it was an ops hustle to divide things, and we had many monitoring things to resolve issues in which we didn't want to like, choke the production environment with the dev environment. On top of that, we had some kind of RESTful services. Uh, many of you probably know Spring, right? How many know Spring or some kind of like fully fledged frameworks? So it's Obik is uh, an open source uh, written by Outbrain and is another Israeli company that we used. It wraps it around, and uh, we had Angular and Node servers uh, running as uh, our front end servers, and we had many persistence layers. Okay. To sum up the all of the things that we need to monitor, I had some many blanks left here in that slide. And these are all of the aspects that we need to take in account and the questions that we need to ask when we come to some kind of monitoring problem. Start off with the basic things. We need to collect our metrics, okay, to show them basically to someone. And we need to do some kind of data monitoring because we have lots of data. We need to store all of these things in some kind of data store or multiple data stores. And we have log monitoring, okay, because everybody does logs. We have dashboards that we need to show to someone or to do or to react with our data and to do alerting over these dashboards or over, over these metrics because that line is not like specific to only the dashboard. You can uh, do alerting over the data sources as well. Okay, so what are the problems? We started off talking with the tools. Let's talk about like the deployment of things. We have a Spark cluster with lots of multiple physical workers. We have uh, maybe a sharded Mongo in which we have multiple uh, physical servers as well. All communicating with each other. We need to like monitor if the servers are up, what's happening with the network, etc. The next thing, Cassandra. Cassandra is a great uh, fully distributed database. We need to monitor many more servers as well because we have an analytics cluster working with Cassandra too. What happens when I need serving? I need to serve data to our clients. So we have web services, UI clients working. Everything is working with our databases as well. So basically the problems are that we have multiple physical servers, multiple logical services as well. We need to scale everything. Okay, we've talked about Docker. We need to auto scale. We need to work with our cloud platform. That means actually more servers, okay? So even collecting all of the metrics from all of these systems becomes a big problem. So your monitoring problem becomes a big data problem as well. 
Okay, this is how our DevOps guy looked when we had all of these servers starting ramping up. And uh, I'll tell you a secret, we didn't have one. Okay, so it basically divided between me and another guy at the company. It's not that pleasant. So let's start off with talking about solutions, okay, because we've talked about problems that we have with big data systems. The basic thing is the monitoring of the operation system. We need to monitor CPU, memory usage, disk space usage, because many of these things, when they, when they fail, our applications fail. How do we do that? We have many agents that we can install. Everything is really open source, and you can use all of these things on premises, on, on cloud providers. You have collect the stats the in which can report metrics to Graphite. How many of you are using Graphite, maybe, or Prometheus as uh, monitoring uh, data sinks? One. Wow, OK. Interesting. Um, I'd like to know afterwards what are you using for. Uh, you have another kind of implementation of a, a service called New Relic that you can use. It has a nice UI. It has a free tier. You can use that as well. Um, and it gives you only less data retention. And if you want to pay, you can pay for it. And you have like alerting thresholds that you can report back with emails, pager duty, et cetera. Cloud. Everybody is running on the cloud or trying to run on the cloud. So cloud service providers have their own monitoring uh, system solutions as well. You have Amazon's CloudWatch. And uh, Google, I think a year and something ago, had bought Stackdriver. It's fully integrated in their system with all of their services. Uh, Stackdriver can get reports from Amazon's CloudWatch as well to, to uh, show and combine all of the metrics in a single place. So it's pretty great. Uh, you pay a bit to use that service because you don't need to manage things yourself. But again, it's a great solution out of the box that you can get without investing lots of time and effort on that solution. Report to where? Okay. One of the important things is we want to see the things, the, the metrics and the things that we report back to our, to our monitoring system. So we have Graphite and Grafana. Grafana is a great web UI that you can show all of the things. How many people are using Kibana? So basically, it's a porting of Kibana to show graphs. Uh, it's a great tool. It's uh, really uh, actively developed right now by the community. And many more features are being added to Grafana. And you can use it on multiple data, sto data sources as well. Graphite, I've heard a company that made a monitoring solution with Elasticsearch as well. CloudWatch, Prometheus, InfluxDB, and many more being integrated to it. If you don't want the hustle of actually managing all of these data sinks, you have uh, solutions like Hosted Graphite, or you have solutions like Datadog, or like uh, many other things that you can collaborate with and send data to them and move all of the ops problems to them. Connections. Um, most of you probably are using some kind of data store. Okay, So you're opening some kind of client to it, and you're opening a connection to it. So we can add an another abstraction layer over our connection and uh, start monitoring them and sending metrics b uh, back to our like, data sync. Uh, what can we monitor? We monitor our open connections, uh, all of our uh, specific queries. Okay? And not only select queries, inserts, and updates, we can do logical things. Okay? Because these things can be like queried on top of the database how many insert uh, queries I had. I don't know, in any database, probably. But I can add another abstraction layer of it saying, I inserted a 1,000 entities of some kind with that connection. So it's really important to see that. And of course, closing connection. And then I can see correlation between things in a single place. OK, maybe I'm reporting all of the things, let's say, for uh, Graphite. And I'm showing, that, showing it on Grafana. I can actually see correlation between system metrics, let's say CPU usage, and specific queries being uh, activated in our system. And that means that I can see that some developer is in inputting, I don't know, like 1,000 or 100,000 entities to our system, and the CPU spikes. This is really interesting, because most of the, most of the places don't show that correlation. And of course, you can do that in any programming language that you'd like. Okay? It, it's all basically up to you. We can do counters, execution, time, execution times, errors. And infrastructure code uh, gives great visibility to what's happening in the system and if we need or uh, why do we need more resources when we need to um, 
let's say, say to our managers that I need more money for our resources. Cassandra, how many of you have used Cassandra? Okay. You probably know how painful it is to monitor Cassandra. Okay. Uh, even if you're not from the ops side with the many problems that may emerge. So Cassandra has its own monitoring solution. It has its agent, and uh, it's called Ops Center. Uh, it was open sourced, I think, in the last uh, version of Cassandra. In three, I don't remember exactly, but it might be a part of Datastax Enterprise. You get out of the box a really amazing tool. Okay, It reports back many of the internal metrics of Cassandra, and zero to hero, you will be great. But what happens when you need to do extra things, maybe collect um, internal metrics of your application and correlate it to Cassandra, then you face a different kind of problem. So you can use, you can use a combined environment of actually using uh, OpsCenter as the base and using the regular Grafana and uh, Graphite solution to report bad metrics. Uh, there's a blog post that I've written. You can read about it of how to actually implement that. You do use plug and play metrics of uh, uh, Graphite using uh, metrics uh, library of Drop Wizard. And you can go back to the basics if you want a per node monitoring system to do DSTAT, IOSTAT, uh, um, IOTOP, and JSTAC to monitor all of the JVM problems and all of the infrastructure problems of a single node. This is how it looks architecture wise. Basically, you have a, a Grafana and Graphite instance with some kind of data stacks uh, op center uh, instance. Their agents are reporting back to op center, and the internal metrics are reporting back to Graphite. Why to use both of them, InfluxDB or Graphite? Because I actually managed to choke Graphite. We didn't have like a really solid uh, deployment of it, and I accidentally did star and reported back around 9 million metrics of Cassandra every second. So basically, it killed Graphite. So if you have, don't have some kind of infrastructure to support that, it might be a problem. And you need some kind of like highly performing database to store all of the metrics. Monitoring Spark. I'll go fast over it, basically, uh, because you have many, many aspects to take in account when you need to monitor Spark. Application executions. Every application in Spark is like a microservice, some kind of batch operation that goes up and down afterwards, and you need to know if all of the microservices communicating with each other, actually, like with the data, uh, did they execute. Resource cons consumption and allocation, because I want to be efficient with my cluster, right? I want to know that I'm actually utilizing all of my infrastructure that I'm paying for. Task failures, what went wrong? What do I need to actually relaunch? And uh, the monitoring of the environment, if all of the physical servers are up or not. And the amount of servers, physical OS metrics of Spark, and of course, infrastructure services that are running in the background, some kind of cleanups that I'm doing, et cetera. You have different kind of uh, ways to do that monitoring. You can do uh, another like uh, graphite sync measurements, and you can see that in the Spark documentation. Uh, you can see JVM metrics because Spark is a JVM-based uh, framework, and the same thing is reported back. But you have many other things that come with the Spark ecosystem out of the box. You have the Spark UI, which is running online services, and you can see where is the data moving, how many tasks are failing right now, in a, maybe in a streaming job or like a batch job. And uh, we have the Spark history server to save all of this metadata over uh, Spark executions in an offline way. We can uh, put the flag and, as true and start monitoring all of these things. We can query uh, the actual infrastructure and the services uh, via the REST API. Okay, so we did many, mo many things like many monitoring solutions with Jenkins and schedule jobs to query the online API to see if we have all of the infrastructure running, and if not, to do some kind of provisioning of servers. And back to the basics, of course, as we've spoken, uh, the basic Linux tools. Uh, you have another blog post by Tips, tips from the Trenches from South Dow that works at uh, Kenshu, you can read. And of course, we got to the data. We need to monitor all of the data and which are the questions that we actually need to, to ask ourselves and our system uh, to know what we need to monitor. So we have a question. Did all the computation occur? Okay. Like, did I calculate all of the data layers? Is there any data missing? Because when we start using like hundreds of terabytes of data, this query becomes really complex. 
How much data do we have? How many of you can tell me right now in your system, okay, raise your hands, please, how, what is the exact amount of data do you have, or some kind of estimate? You're awesome, you're awesome, really. It's one of the hardest questions to ask, okay? And if you can answer this question, you can solve many, many problems out of the box, because when you go off to, I don't know, some kind of consultants or uh, to some kind of, I don't know, tool that you're using and you want to form some kind of complaint because it's not working uh, with the SLA that they've uh, promised you or it's not working in the manner that you needed to, they ask you, okay, how much data are you de dealing with? W which kind of queries are you doing? And if you, it's not transparent to you, it's really, really hard to answer. And of course, is all of the data in a database. It can be an easy, like, Easy query to do if you have like single instance of a database, but what happens when you have a distributed system and you have a distributed database like Cassandra? There is no count star, okay? And it becomes a really big problem to know uh, like real existence of the data in a specific uh, system. So basically you get to, to the problem that a friend of mine uh, defined, data quality assurance, DQA, okay? So, what, what are the answers to these questions? So basically, keep it simple. Okay, nothing has to be complex to do uh, to have some kind of solution. So basically, we had Jenkins scheduled tasks running with Maven J units because we were using Java use, uh, mostly, and uh, the same queries that we used to do on databases and data sources we used to do with J unit tests. And after the the query re resulted back, we used to report back to some kind of data sync. Creating monitoring project, which uh, we've checked these kind of things. The database data existence. We've checked if all of the files uh, existed on S3 with distributed jet jobs. Data flow uh, and coming errors. And um, any data source that you can imagine that we're using, we used to query and we used to report back all of the data. Of course, uh, we used to write all of the metrics to Graphite because this was our solution and uh, report task executions as well to Graphite. And we used to show everything, we have dashboards with Grafana. About the data answers, really, it doesn't really matter how you answer these questions, okay? Just do it, do them. And um, can you follow the results on ti over time? This is really important to see, like, historical data to compare the, to your current state, how many failures you had last week comparing to now because you've deployed a new version. Uh, know your data flow and know that things not might happen, might fail, I'm sorry, it will fail. And what to do when it fails. And uh, it's make sure it's easy to add monitoring because most of us are developers. I'm, I'm in the origin a developer, okay? And I'm lazy. And I think that most of the people are lazy. So if it's hard to do something, you won't do that. So it's really important to make it easy for developers to add monitoring to our system and to get a feedback loop from all of the things that they do in dev when they are in production. And um, don't trust the others to do monitoring, okay? People usually tend to blame the DevOps guy that something is, isn't working and uh, I don't care because it works on my machine, don't do that because basically you will lose control of your code and of, of, uh, of your application too. Uh, we've talked about monitoring and logging monitoring. How many of you are using the ELK stack or any some kind of uh, monitoring solution? Okay, awesome, there are a few people. And uh, basically we have different kind of solution. We have gray log as well and if you have some kind of cloud service uh, maybe Amazon or Google, you have log aggregation built in for all of your containers, for all of your services. So it's really amazing for out of the box getting this problem to scale, okay? Because th this becomes a really big problem once you have logs over time. Uh, you have multiple servers running uh, Logstash, reporting back to some kind of Redis queue, and then you have an indexer storing everything in Elastic and showing via Kibana. This is the Elk stack. You have a different kind of architecture which, which, in which you can implement uh, with like shipping logs yourself with Log4j. This works too. Basically, you get these kind of nice dashboards. Look shiny. Okay, this is really amazing. You can get uh, really amazing results and to show dashboards to people who don't come from tech. It's really nice. So, did someone say dashboards? We've talked about dashboards. You have Redash. 
Uh, it's an open source tool written in a company that was actually closed everything.me. And all of the, their like, uh, supporting infrastructure that they've written, they've open sourced. It's really amazing. And Arik, that guy, uh, came out from everything.me and took that project and started working on the open source and both like the hosted service provider. What is Redash? It's basically a dashboard which connects to multiple data sources and shows everything with the latency that you'd like. Okay, it can query multiple times all of these data sources. It's written in Python, so you can actually develop connectors to your own databases if you'd like. Uh, and it has on-premises or a hosted solution. It depends if you'd like to run it yourself or to uh, pay for the service. This is how it looks. Okay, basically you can show graphs of some kind. Uh, you can define the queries on the query language that you'd like. It's really nice, okay, and you can use it out of the box. It's not that complex. Uh, and of course, we need to do alerting over all of these metrics. So what we did is take a simple solution. We need to alert things, and we need to, uh, a place to show all of the alerts. So we used an open source tool called Siren, which creates a connection to Graphite, and we can alert over, over uh, certain thresholds. We don't need to do anything complex. We need to maybe, say, send pager duty messages, or uh, I don't know, like HipChat, Slack. It in integrates well with everything, and even somebody at the company committed back code that needed, the, I don't know, for some kind of use case for us, and uh, they got his pull request. So it's pretty nice. So let's summarize the stack. We had our template. We wanted to do metric collections, so we had that with collect D and stats D. We needed data monitoring, so we did that with Jenkins to schedule jobs. We stored everything in the data sources, the data sinks that we've talked about, which is our graphite, InfluxDB. I've actually tried Prometheus as well. It has a different approach. Log monitoring we did with Kibana, uh, and we did alerting with Siren. Of course, dashboard dashboarding, we had multiple um, solutions there too, Grafana, Redash, New Relic, and we used uh, CloudWatch uh, in that time to get some kind of measurements too. Don't do that, please. I urge you, as developers, works fine in DevOps problem now, doesn't work, and it detaches the whole development process from what we're running, and we're running to give value for our users. Okay, and if you take that problem and you throw it to somebody else who doesn't know your code, which doesn't know your code, it's, it's a big problem. Who does the monitoring in the company? Everybody does monitoring, okay? Even if it's simple and we don't want everybody to actually start working with that amount of tools, we can do the basic things, okay? Even in development, we can use regular scripts, a Python script which queries a data source, and we report back something to someone to know the measurements of how our, is our system running. Uh, it's really, really important to connect everybody that way to the production system because not always we can access the data in the production, okay? Some, sometimes we have data regulations too. This is our DevOps guy after all of this monitoring solution. This is the best photo of him actually happy that I found. So this is Tion Happy. So let's get to the conclusions and sum everything up with the questions that we've asked and what are the answers that we needed to, to answer with. Correlate application system and uh, application system metrics together. When you see everything together, it's much easier to see what's happening with your system and what might mail function or will mail function. Ask monitoring questions, uh, answer them with dashboards, with something that you actually can show and visualize all of the data because a problem that you can show probably you can't solve afterwards because you don't know what's happening. Keep it simple. What is simple is good. Simple is simple to implement as well, and most of the people will be able to do that. Alert, actually, what you can action afterwards on, okay? Because if you alert on something that the uh, solution for it is to restart, then do like an automatic restart. Basically, what happens when you have lots of like 500 emails after a night saying uh, service is malfunctioning, you will do like select all, delete, and that's it. So why alert it on it 500 times? It's really useless. Measure whatever you can, okay? And this is the only way that you will know if you're improving or not. And the most important thing, monitor your KPI, bus the business KPIs, okay? I don't know, choose three, four metrics maximum that you would like to show to your business managers and monitor them all the time. They will measure you on these metrics, 
and then it will be much easier to show why you need things and when you need them. And if I haven't convinced you that everything is pretty nice when you show graphs, graphs are cool, okay? This might be my face when uh, looking on monotonic graphs and seeing how things evolve over time. It's pretty cool. So, questions. We have, I think, five minutes. Again? Ah, okay. What, what, uh, the question was, what I think about MongoDB Ops Manager. I haven't used it, actually. We used to monitor MongoDB ourselves with that manner. Uh, I think it's not, it can be on-premises, right? No, only on the, what? On, only on the enterprise, yeah, but you can install everything uh, on top. I haven't used it, actually. I don't know, but we used to monitor MongoDB ourselves with the basic metrics that we actually needed. Again, this was our solution. We didn't have like a complex deployment. It wasn't even sharded uh, when I was there. Currently, it is sharded. But yeah, it, it's, a, it's a problem usually when you have a distributed system to monitor. Any other question? Yes. <laughs> yeah, did we need to monitor the monitoring system? Basically, yes. Okay, we needed to monitor the graphite uh, server and to see that it's not uh, uh, capping there. Uh, but again, you report back to some kind of different source because if graphite is dead and you want to see the monitoring there, it's pretty problematic. Uh, but we did cross monitor things. We did have like, I had even like uh, regular Python scripts which monitored back to uh, graphite and then killed the job themselves and then reported back to the, with emails because this was like the regular way. So you can do some kind of hacky way as long as you know how you monitor things. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So basically I'll go through this slide. Uh, I'm accessible via every method that you'd like. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty responsive. If you'd like, you can uh, join the communities too. I know some lectures are in Hebrew. Okay, but many lectures are in English uh, from visitors from abroad too, so you can both uh, join the Big Things community or the Cloud GDG one. You have Cloud GDG communities all over the world as well. Uh, I think you have in, G in GDG uh, Italy too. And thank you very much for listening and uh, being so patient at this time of the day. Thank you.